medicine in Istanbul, Turkey, completed his psychiatric training um, at the Brockton VA um, in, in child psychiatry at uh, Mass General. He serves as director of psychiatric services at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Boston and um, is staffed at the um, MGH Bresler Program for Autism and Pediatric Psychopharmacology. Uh, his research focuses on novel treatments for autism spectrum disorder across the lifespan. Current treatments focus on near infrared LED light to improve core features associated with autism, including social cognition and executive function. Uh, he also focuses on psychiatric disorder and long-term outcomes among children who experience severe burns. Um, he's a member of the media committee for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and regular presents, presents at national meetings. So we welcome him for um, a great talk and really interesting new treatment uh, for children with autism. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction, Dr. Fry. Let me uh, share my screen and um, uh, then let's get uh, started. So uh, can you see uh, this? Yes. Yes. All right. So um, um, thank you for uh, logging in and, and staying logged in uh, to the symposium, it was which dedicated and devoted souls at uh, the Brain Foundation. They made possible um, for my colleagues um, to, and I to conduct these projects and investigate ways to improve the lives of our patients and their families um, who live with autism spectrum disorders. Innovation and curiosity in, in service um, um, of, of, of our patients and families needs friends and support, especially with the limited resources available out there now. And, and these resources are further uh, <laughs> limited during this pandemic we're in, um, which makes help and support extended by the Brain Foundation ever so more meaningful and, and, and vital to this endeavors. And um, in which I also hope everybody is doing well in, 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 in your places um, um, during this uh, COVID pandemic. In the next half hour, I'll, uh, I hope to address, address my part in this uh, symposium packed with a lot of uh, cutting edge information. Um, so, and I'm very excited to share <clears throat> our recent findings of a novel treatment approach, as you mentioned, is uh, transcranial photobiomodulation, which is a, um, yeah, it is a tongue twister. So um, in uh, um, my uh, disclosures, I'm going to uh, review uh, um, the, some somatic treatments um, that are not, uh, they are off-label, they are not approved um, for uh, use in, um, in patient care uh, in children um, by FDA. So before I talk about the transcranial photobiomodulation, um, let me um, quickly remind, let me quickly remind ourselves about the autism spectrum disorder. This is a lifelong, uh, it's a um, development, neurodevelopmental condition that affects up to 2% of uh, youth um, and with, um, has a lifelong course of uh, deficits in social awareness, social salience, and um, results in uh, reciprocal communication problems uh, leading to difficulties in socialization with, um, and comes with a host of restrictive interests, uh, repetitive behaviors, and um, atypical sensory reactions that interfere with efficient function and so on. To this date, uh, there exist no uh, treatments um, that address the core features of autism spectrum disorder. Instead, current uh, treatment approaches uh, target associated comorbidities, um, such as ADHD or mood and anxiety disorders. Um, recent imaging studies uh, now implicate some disruptions of activity in certain brain regions, structures, and their connectivity uh, to other areas, again, within the brain. Collectively, these areas are involved in mediating the social cognition tasks. Um, uh, of the several implicated areas, the anterior cingulate cortex, um, uh, and particularly the, 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 the dorsal part and uh, perigenual portions, are shown to um, be involved in assessing social salience, uh, social processing, and um, um, and the so, um, then this um, awareness of the social state of 
self and others and uh, emotional regulation. In our patients with autism spectrum disorder, these areas tend to be functioning um, out of sync or in, uh, in at slower pace in comparison to the other areas in the brain. And, um, and if there was a way to selectively you know, increase uh, the activity of these areas, perhaps we could affect the change. Um, and there comes the uh, light. Um, one approach that may offer such an advantage is light. The use of light or electromagnetic waves in, um, in medical field is not a new concept. We are all familiar with the light therapy for uh, seasonal affective disorder. And even before that though, the um, various wavelengths of light were, have been used in, um, in, in various uh, um, um, medical fields and um, uh, for uh, various medical conditions. And um, for ranging from uh, the, vitamin D metabolism, ranging from uh, treatment of a um, newborn jaundice um, to, to assessment of um, burn wound, uh, the depth um, of uh, burn um, injury, burn wound, and, um, uh, and in, uh, now um, also used in, um, in some of the diagnostic approaches um, as a, a near-infrared spectroscopy in a, um, um, a, um, non, um, a more benign way of looking into brain function in infants, for example. Now, what is the core of the transcranial biomodulation, what, the photobiomodulation? It is, so first off, all that is light is not visible. It's in, um, in fact, most light is invisible, um, at least to the um, um, human eye. So this is the photo part. So the, um, in this wide range, wide infinite range of um, electromagnetic waves, it is a mere speck uh, that the pods in our eyes are, uh, can actually detect. The energy transmitted in the light uh, it, it, uh, particle, it triggers activity in its target, and thus it, med it mediates the effects of that light on that target. For example, in the eyes, that would be the vision. The wavelength of this light, it determines the energy that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the light particle carries. And each pod in our little eyes, uh, there are these little um, um, receptors in a way in our eyes, they get activated at different energy levels. And that's how we perceive different colors and their counters, so the shapes, and, 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 uh, and that's how vision occurs. Uh, red light in this uh, range here, this is the, uh, uh, so the red light has the longest wavelength uh, and purple as the shortest wavelength. Anything beyond this is not visible to the eye. And um, now, e though, what is, so the near infrared light, which is this um, right below the red light range, uh, which is, not visible to the eye, as I said, is still um, um, uh, able to penetrate into skin and skull tissue. And um, in more than, an, um, in, in some meaningful amount, huh? um, and it, um, it can penetrate into the tissue. And then during this though, it is not, you know, it, it, it's a non-thermal, like it's not generating heat um, 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 or, or, um, or any problems like that, but it is visible to the mitochondria, um, which is a part, in, I mean, earlier, uh, my, uh, my colleague talked about the mitochondrial disorders and in that the, 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 the mitochondria being the factory of the neuron, it, as it gets activated by this, as it picks up on this light and gets activated at this rate, the, what follows is a cascade of um, a cascade of uh, uh, chemical reactions and um, and 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 it results in a um, activation of the metabolism. Um, and uh, which is the so which forms the bio part, like the the, the target of this light, and uh, and there f follows the um, in, um, increased cellular activity and gene transcription, and a change in that cell's activity and behavior in a way. 
So hence is the modulation. And there comes the photobiomodulation. And the transcranial part is that the light is uh, exposed transcranially or outside of the cranium into it. Um, the mechanism there, uh, postulated mechanism, how the mitochondrion gets activated is there are uh, cytochromes or uh, um, ends or uh, um, um, enzymes in the in the mitochondrion that uh, um, respond to um, differently to certain um, wavelengths of light and um, and in these the as the light energy penetrates into it it displaces a part of the molecule thus activating that enzyme which results in the um, uh, um, ensuing metabolic changes so now, what happens then as a result? Well, we, um, the, the resulting effects of this activation uh, may include several um, uh, uh, processes that are now uh, postulated or theorized. Well, what we believe is, is that it may reduce uh, the uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines in these, in these cells. In, in other words, um, it may reduce the inflammation, which is um, uh, um, considered to be um, part of, uh, if you know, in, um, to, to con um, con considered to be contributing to um, autism spectrum uh, degenesis or other psychiatric conditions as well. Um, it may stimulate uh, this uh, light activation may stimulate neurogenesis and neuroprotection as a result as well. So uh, that's how we uh, think it results in um, neuro neuron adaptation or uh, rejuvenation um, in, in the long run. So uh, now these aspects of uh, the near infrared light has been of interest and, um, and it was previously or more recently studied um, or explored um, by our, our colleagues and um, who conducted a four week uh, clinical study with, um, and used an ultra pulse monochromatic, that is, you know, a, 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 a one set wavelength of light within the visible range though they used. And, um, and it was delivered to the, the sides of the, the, uh, the brain, the, to the temporal region and the base of the skull. And it, they found about 81% of um, uh, response or improvement uh, measured by the uh, by um, um, scales, uh, uh, clinician rated scales and uh, um, um, in, in, in their patients. A little more detail on that. Uh, so this that was a double blind uh, clinical trial. They had 40 um, uh, uh, patients, uh, five to 17 year olds, who all of whom had a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And the light, again, um, uh, as I mentioned, was in within the visible range. And um, they used twice a week, five minutes of treatments for about four weeks. And that was sufficient to see for them the following results that, that is a, a significant and a meaningful decline in um, um, irritability measures uh, um, uh, that, uh, or, or irritability symptoms of their patients. They targeted not the core features of autism spectrum, but the irritability that associates um, uh, commonly and presents in, uh, commonly in our patients with autism spectrum disorder. So, and uh, they also found uh, about 80, so the, uh, in the clinician rated um, 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 scales, they found about an 81%, so 17 patients on the, uh, on the, on the treatment arm uh, um, that attained a very meaningful improvement in their, um, um, in their um, autism related irritability. What we did more recently, um, uh, what we con uh, uh, concluded uh, it was an open label single group design study um, where we uh, targeted the core deficits in autism spectrum disorder in our adult patients. And um, uh, where um, we 
used our primary measurements as the social responsiveness scale and the clinical global impression. Um, the social responsiveness scale is a self-rated um, and informant rated scale and clinical global impression is a clinician rated scale. And we also looked at um, and the overall function of our patients um, and, um, and also uh, we were curious about the ADHD um, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder symptoms, um, particularly among those um, who had that comorbidity, which is a highly comorbid condition um, in, in autism spectrum disorder. And we defined prior to study, the responder would be you know, one who attains at least 25% or more reduction in their uh, social responsiveness scale. And, um, and, and, those, and at the same time would attain at least um, two or less, or so a marked improvement in clinical global impression was rated by um, um, the study uh, clinician. Um, uh, it was a, uh, we uh, considered twice a week uh, treatment um, um, for eight weeks. Uh, the reason this is different from that four weeks, I think, is, well, one, at the time we were not aware of that study ongoing, but two, um, our colleagues who have uh, explored the uh, uh, transcranial photobiomodulation in uh, patients with depression um, and with really uh, promising results had uh, used this approach um, of um, um, eight uh, uh, twice weekly treatments. We started with 20 minutes and plan to go to 25 and to 30 um, with every other week or so increments. And the our, our patients uh, traveled to the uh, hospital. This is pre-COVID era, of course. And this is what the device looked like here, uh, which was um, you know, placed uh, to um, the uh, um, frontal uh, region of the of, uh, of the brain of the skull. And, uh, in, and and held in place with a head band or a net, and um, and while the patients rested uh, for that duration of time, the um, we had um, so uh, twelve uh, uh, patients um, um, were enrolled and uh, screened and enrolled, and um, eleven met the uh, participation criteria. One per one patient uh, withdrew. Uh, consent uh, because of uh, some scheduled demands that just changed. Um, so uh, 10 were enrolled into the study, but the, per the, the, the person who withdrew had the, completed the um, initial test though. So we included um, uh, that person in our safety analyses as well. And um, here are the, you know, our uh, participants were mostly um, yeah, male, and uh, and the with a medium um, with an average age uh, thirty years old, um, and we um, in 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 our um, uh, participants who, um, that we included in uh, efficacy analyses, um, the highest comorbidity we found was the ADHD, which is uh, consistent with the rest of our clinical. Uh, population that we serve, and um, and the and all of our patients were on some adjunct medications, uh, mostly prescribed uh, were the stimulant meds and then the antidepressants and antipsychotics coming uh, behind. Uh, this uh, um, uh, during the study participation, we um, yeah, we avoided any medication changes, um, and if there was any need for a medication change, uh, we would uh, we would have um, um, discontinued the uh, study uh, for for uh, for that person. Uh, but there was no incident of that need um, um, during their participation. And so all um, enrolled uh, and started the treatment, except for one, um, completed the study. And at the end point here, what we found um, that our patients' uh, social responsiveness scale uh, totals, they dropped significantly. The, uh, and this, this was a statistically significant uh, improvement, yes. Um, but I must mention this, uh, that the, um, so it dropped from 104 to 73, it is huge, but it is still within the clinically meaningful range. That is, um, it is still, um, the 60 uh, is the agreed uh, cutoff point. Uh, so our patients 
at the end of their participation were still dealing or struggling with uh, these core features, but had attained a, a clinically significant improvement. And we saw the similar improvement in the subscales of the uh, of the social responsiveness. Um, um, scale that is the uh, the social communication, the re repetitive ritualistic behaviors, uh, social motivation and awareness. Um, 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 so four out of five subscales also attained a clinically um, uh, statistically significant um, improvements. And um, here is you know give, um, having a you know a small sample allows us to look at you know individually um, the improvements or change in the scores and um, so uh, there was so we see this precipitant decline um, and um, now with uh, um, at endpoint um, we also uh, saw a, the global assessment functioning well, uh, um, and uh, see and the clinical rate the clinician rate of CGI scores um, were remarkable too. Um, so seven uh, patients attained a, a two or less, um, that a score of two or less, which is very remarkable or remarkable improvement in, in their um, clinical condition compared to baseline. And, um, and the global assessment of functioning, um, there was about you know, more than 10 points increase, which uh, represents in the GAF uh, in the GAF continuum or the global assessment of functioning scale continuum and improve um, a, is a, a, um, a categorical improvement um, um, that it, for, so a categorical improvement in the overall function too. Um, in our secondary measures, uh, looking at the ADHD uh, symptoms, we saw a statistically significant drop in the severity, but I must mention the from 34 to 28 uh, or 29 is not a clinically very, it's not a clinically significant drop. However, it can, you know, we, all, we also know the, um, the ADHD comorbid with autism spectrum disorder tends to represent more robust form of this condition of, of ADHD itself. So even a small improvement like this might be meaningful, but we need bigger um, uh, sample uh, and bigger participation to see whether that holds up. Um, what we, we did not you know, um, expect, but we found was that an, an overall improvement in the executive functions that were um, uh, um, rated by uh, again uh, um, self-rated um, self-rated scale, uh, the behavior rating inventory of executive function, and um, we saw, we found uh, or we noticed saw statistically significant improvement in subscales and in all the um, um, uh, sub measures indexes indices of uh, this uh, brief, which suggests an overall improvement in executive function. Um, in, in, in uh, following the, our patients' participation. Um, so uh, in the end, five out of 10 patients, uh, 10 part, uh, patients met the responder criteria. Um, the, uh, the CGI was, oh, it's not six, it's seven, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but five met this uh, responder criteria in both, uh, um, in both responder criteria. There were no serious adverse events. Nobody had to drop out of the study because of a side effect. Um, there were um, um, transient uh, um, side effect incidents. One patient had a headache. One patient had a difficulty sleeping after first uh, um, exposure, uh, after their first uh, treatment episode, uh, which then spontaneously resolved. Um, one person experienced warmth at the application application site again up, um, at the first uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, first uh, treatment uh, and then got um, used to but we captured it as a side effect because um, the, the the patient spontaneously raised the point what we found was a remarkable adherence rate of 98 percent which is really um, uh, which is really remarkable I think in in, in um, uh, adherence or um, to treatment, um, which is a problem, a common problem in, in, in the realm of psychiatry. So um, based on these findings, we uh, concluded that um, transcranial photobiomodulation is, yes, it's a non-invasive and is a potentially safe intervention. 
it's uh, promising in treating core features of autism spectrum disorder and associating executive function deficits. So, and it is uh, well received and tolerated among our patients, and it is feasible to explore it. So, uh, based on these findings, we um, you now the future studies would need to now focus on um, exploring uh, um, uh, transcranial photobiomodulation. A, um, a, a effect, efficacy, and safety in uh, double-blind uh, randomized clinical trials. So um, this is where the support is vital. Um, this is the, the, the point um, that determines whether all we hope and aspire uh, will be made reality. And this is what the, uh, the Brain Foundation is, is, is making possible um, there um, and by supporting this investigation of these interventions in service of, of improvements in lives of those that surround us. With the generous and vital support from the uh, Brain Foundation, we are now um, launching a randomized and uh, um, a double-blind clinical trial which is the gold standard to investigate any new interventions of um, validity. This study is, uh, is going to be conducted via telemedicine too, and, uh, which um, during the current COVID-19 pandemic, we find it fortuitous that a telemedicine um, actually is a valid approach, works well, enables us to, um, uh, to reach those that otherwise we can't, um, and, and, and it allows us to conduct these uh, studies safely too. Um, what we will be uh, uh, looking at in this study is, the, uh, so it's, at eight, it's going to be an eight week uh, uh, long, double blind, sham controlled, um, randomized clinical trial um, where patients um, 18 to 59 uh, year old, so adult patients with autism spectrum disorder will uh, be enrolled to receive daily in-home transcranial uh, TPBM treatments uh, during this period. We are going to follow a fixed uh, titration and, um, and, and we'll start with the 20 minutes to 30, 40 to 50, which is um, um, a longer exposure than um, our previous study, but again is uh, supported by, um, uh, by findings from our colleagues who, all, again, who also explore this um, um, intervention in, in patients with depression. And um, we will uh, follow our uh, uh, patients' progress during regularly scheduled visits and, um, and, um, and, and will include measurements of, again, a social responsiveness scale and the, uh, the clinical global impression. Uh, so both patient and clinician rated scales and our response will be based on uh, or the response definition will be a patient who has attained 25% or more reduction in their um, in these um, uh, scales that measure the core features of autism spectrum disorder. Now, one thing I have learned in, in life is that a genius is in the company you keep. New things and innovation needs friends and uh, hardworking people. None of this work would be possible without the tremendous people I have the good fortune to work with and uh, the support by the, the Brain Foundation. I'm blessed with the opportunity to have Dr. Biederman, Dr. Joshi as my mentors. And, um, and, and finally, I, I thank all my patients and their families who uh, place their trust and confidence in our abilities to care for them and their loved ones and for their most important asset, time, uh, that they give us uh, that allows us to learn and investigate ways to improve the care for them and all others. Um, so um, with that, I'll uh, pause and uh, hear uh, questions and, 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 and comments, please. And sh I should stop sharing, correct? Yes. Yeah, I think um, in the sake of time, if you could answer, answer the questions uh, through the chat for the Q&A, it would be great um, just uh, because of time limitations. Absolutely. But Absolutely. That was a wonderful presentation Thank and you. really a promising treatment. So, yeah, we look forward to hearing more. So, all right. Great. I will remain in the chat. Okay. So, great. Now, um, I have the uh, distinct pleasure of and chair of the Department of Psychiatry um, and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University where she leads the major laboratory steering committee and directs the Parker Lab of Social Neurosciences Research. Uh, the principal goal of her research is to better understand the biology of social functioning 
across a range of species and to translate these fundamental insights to drive development of novel diagnostic tools to detect and precision medicine to treat um, social impairments in patient populations. The findings from a research have led to two patent applications and have frequently been recognized by Spectrum in the annual top 10 list of studies that change the field of autism. She received her undergraduate and graduate degrees from University of Michigan, completed a postdoc at Stanford University. She joined the Stanford faculty in 2007, um, and she is affiliated with the California National Primate Research Center and elected a member of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and the Cavill Fellow of the US uh, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's supported by many uh, federal and private uh, foundations. And so with that, I will uh, let her take it away and tell us about vasopressin. Thanks for the kind introduction, Rich. It's good to see you virtually. Um, let me, oh, I think you need to stop. Yeah, there we go. All right. It's always a challenge to be the speaker keeping you guys from lunch. So I'm going to try to keep it lively here. All right. Um, so the nice thing about speaking to um, an autism community is autism needs very little introduction. I'm gonna keep it brief, um, but make a couple key points. So as we all know, autism is diagnosed on the basis of two core features. Um, the main one that we'll be focusing today is on these persistent social communication and interaction challenges as well as the presence of restricted repetitive behaviors. Autism is clinically heterogeneous and has a variety of um, behavioral, medical, um, and cognitive comorbidities. Currently, the diagnosis of autism is based on phenomenology, so signs, symptoms, course of um, illness. And because it's poorly understood, biologically, there are no robust neurochemical markers to make the diagnosis, unlike other aspects of medicine, and we have no standard of care laboratory-based tests currently. Um, in terms of treatments, um, we have behavioral therapies. There are only two drugs approved by the FDA to treat autism, which treat um, associated features like irritability and have negative side effect profiles. These are two antipsychotics, and zero that treat the core features presently. But the point I want to make to sort of set the talk is that this lack of medication options for autism um, is, due, is due to the drug development crisis more generally. And so 90% of central nervous system or brain medications fail in clinical trials. So we've um, drugs that were wildly effective in animal models, mostly rodent models fail when we test them in patients. And 50 to 80% of these medication failures can be attributable to selection of poor animal models. And this is particularly true for rodent models, which even when genetically engineered, often don't recapitulate the core symptoms that we would be interested in treating. Um, for us, when we came, when I came to the field, I was interested in thinking about this opportunity to develop a refined animal model that had um, higher translational potential. So today in my talk, I'll be speaking to you about this translational research program that we initiated, which began with developing a valid animal model of autism, translating these findings to people with autism, and then testing a medication based on the biology that we had discovered. So when we started thinking about animal model development, we really held ourselves to a high standard. We wanted the onset to be neurodevelopmental, just like autism, so symptoms emerge early in childhood. And we wanted what's called face validity, which is the outward similar, similarity in appearance between the model's attributes and patient's symptoms. So this would involve a complex social cognition impairments in a highly social diurnal, meaning day active species with vision as its primary sensory modality. We were also interested in establishing what's called construct validity, which is it's the similarity to the underlying causes of the disease. So in the past, we were interested in these spontaneous um, natural social deficits. So autism in primates had been previously modeled using brain lesions 
or um, peer rearing where you would remove the parents and the baby would be reared in isolation, which um, modeled more particularly situations like Romanian orphanage rearing. And so we thought that if we could see spontaneous social impairments, um, that we could better model um, autism. And what we wanted was what we call homologous, homologous genes and circuits. So it means that the biology that we're interested in in our animal model would be conserved evolutionarily in the animal and the patients. And then we also wanted predictive validity, which is the model's ability to identify and evaluate drugs for therapeutic safety and efficacy. And so two sort of um, lessons learned from the past. Drugs are often tested in what I'll call neurotypical animals. So they don't even have the um, target behaviors we're interested in modifying. And then other drugs have been tested in species like thalidomide, which caused severe birth defects. And that was only tested in rodents. It was deemed safe and then was tested and had disastrous consequences in humans. And when we went back and tested this in marmoset monkeys and, and in rhesus macaques, we saw the actual birth defects. And so having a model um, that's closely related to humans can also help with safety. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that our animals were housed in complex social housing in species typical enrichment so that if we saw social impairments, they weren't the result of adverse lab conditions. And so for us, these criteria pointed to the value in developing a primate model. Um, and so when we started thinking about points of entry for um, model validation and translational strategies, I was interested in thinking about behavior in these core features. And an observation that was made, you know, probably about 20 years ago by John Constantino was that autistic traits are common, heritable, and con continuously distributed in the general population. And so what we were interested in was taking a behavior first, first approach and identifying naturally occurring social um, impairments in rhesus monkeys. And then I'll tell you a little bit after that, once we created the model about our biomarker discovery and translation of these biomarkers from animals to people. So we decided to pick old world monkeys because they outside of um, apes were the most closely related to humans. And um, we focused on rhesus macaques, which are highly social. They have complex social cognition abilities that have been well demonstrated. They have vision as their primary sensory modality. They exhibit stable individual differences in social behavior. And we knew from some earlier work that they had spontaneous social deficits. And so I took the show on the road to the California National Primate Research Center, which is about 100 miles from Stanford. And it has 5,000 um, rhesus monkeys that are housed outdoors in these very large field corrals, so half acre field corrals. They live in mixed complex groups and they consist of all ages and you can study them across the lifespan. Um, we've developed over time three ways to identify monkeys with naturally occurring social deficits. So one is to go out and do fo focal animal sampling. Um, and we've created a quantitative non-social index. So what we do is observe the animals quantitatively, and then we're able to identify animals at the extremes of this very large population. We also reverse translated the social responsiveness scale, um, which we call the macaque social responsiveness scale. And, um, and so this was an instrument that we've used in many of our um, clinical trials previously. And we're able to show that we could also see um, high SRS scores in these um, very low social animals that have these spontaneous impairments. And we've also um, developed a variety of behavioral tests that I don't, I don't have time to go into where we can ask questions about very specific behaviors that are altered in people with autism and ask if our low social monkeys possess them. Um, so I'm just going to give you a broad overview. All of this work is published. We've done, we've done it over the about the last 10 years. But what we found is that these low social monkeys have behavioral features quite relevant to human autism. So um, they have a greater burden of autistic like traits on the macaque social responsiveness scale. We see um, on these detailed behavioral tests involving eye tracking, abnormal, um, abnormalities in species, typical perception and reaction to social stimuli. Um, in the home cage, we see impairment in reciprocal social interactions and particularly in pro-social initiation of behaviors that are critical um, for this species, um, particularly grooming. 
Um, we did a medical record review and showed that um, these low social monkeys have greater traumatic injuries and greater bullying by, peer, uh, by peers, which worsen with their autistic-like trait burden. And we've also had um, some good success with identifying subtle social information processing deficits in very young rhesus monkeys that predict with 100% accuracy this low social phenotype later in adulthood. So then we were next interested so that since we had this robust animal model in um, conducting some biomarker discovery. And so what we did was um, we had groups of low social and high social monkeys, and we made measurements that I was interested in having direct and immediate streamlined translation. And I was particularly interested in cerebral spinal fluid because in neurology diseases such as uh, multiple sclerosis and a variety of dementias, um, have their neurochemical signatures most ro robustly evident in spinal fluid. And so when we began this research, I was interested in evaluating biological signaling pathways in both spinal fluid and blood um, for um, neurochemical systems that had been implicated in pro-social behaviors in mammals, which include two related neuropeptides, oxytocin and arginine vasopressin. And so I'll, going forward, call this either, you'll see AVP on my slide, you might see vasopressin, you might see arginine vasopressin, it's the same thing. Um, and these had been implicated in um, pro-social behavior. And then there were a couple um, different kinase signaling pathways, which had been implicated in um, syndromic forms of autism. Um, 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 that are listed here. And so when we put all these biomarkers in the hopper and we basically just said, can you classify in a machine learning approach, we could do so with 93% accuracy, but we didn't know at the time what biology was driving this differentiation between high and low sociality. And so then we did a logistic regression, which basically asked which of these are the most important drivers. And what we found was um, we saw that spinal fluid levels of vasopressin, but not blood levels, um, and two pieces of these kinase signaling pathways could with very high accuracy differentiate high and low social monkeys. But if we think that this is a potential driver in these group differences, we'd wanna see group differences in their, the neurochemical levels. And we only saw this for CSF levels of vasopressin. Um, and so what I also wanna do is point out here is that um, vasopressin in the brain has been known for quite some time as selectively regulating pro-social behavior in male mammals. And what's interesting is our current understanding of autism is that autism is much more prevalent in males than females. And I found this quite interesting that we saw these impairments potentially in the signaling pathway in these male animals. So we also did some additional work showing that um, vasopressin levels um, were highly uh, correlated with time spent in social grooming, uh, which is a key socially motivated feature um, for macaques, and it requires high levels of social competence to perform successfully. Um, and what we would like to know with a biomarker is that it would be stable. And so we did this, um, we measured vasopressin levels in spinal fluid in macaques on four different occasions across a four month period. And on the x-axis, what you can see is the individual monkeys and what you can see on the y-axis is the CSF vasopressin. And what you can also see is that we see these individual difference, differences across monkeys and CSF vasopressin is highly stable within individuals. And then in a replication cohort, what we found was that just knowing CSF level of vasopressin um, could, would allow us to correctly classify monkeys um, 28 out of 30 times by just knowing CSF vasopressin alone. So there's been a lot of work done, particularly with funding from the Simons Foundation on high confidence autism susceptibility genes. There's been about 100 to identified currently, but vasopressin isn't one of them. And so one of the questions I get frequently is, well, what do you think is going on if this robust effect happens so often in all the animals you're studying? And so we were interested in asking, maybe it's a common pathway. And so there's been a lot of speculation that these genes summon and interact 
to converge on a few common pathways and vasopressin could potentially be one of them. And so what we asked was, is it possible that CSF levels of vasopressin are responsible for these individual differences in autistic-like trait burden. And we weren't able to do this study in people, but we were in monkeys. And what we showed was that the macaque social responsiveness scale is continuously distributed. And very interestingly, the, um, and this score, this is um, a, a reverse scale, a reverse scored scale. So the lower your CSF vasopressin levels, the greater your autistic trait symptom um, severity. So low social monkeys are not people with autism. And so one of the possibilities was that this might have limited insights into ASD. And so what we did was ask, does the biology translate to patients? And so um, with some Herculean effort, we went and we um, pulled together a bunch of different research groups and kind of a boots on the ground um, effort, we're able to get um, uh, spinal fluid samples from kids with and without autism. And what we were able to show was that in our first cohort, we could correctly classify 13 out of 14 children by just knowing their CSF vasopressin level alone. And as you can see here, we saw um, significantly um, that the uh, people with autism had much lower CSF vasopressin levels. And um, we were, uh, and, and a limitation of this study was that all these kids were coming in for other reasons to get a spinal tap. And so we were able to um, pair up with Sue Sweeto at, um, and I, at the National Institute of Health, where she had been doing um, a research study collecting spinal fluid as part of a research indication in very well characterized kids with autism. And we were able to um, replicate this finding and show that vasopressin levels were much lower in children with autism. And because Sue had all of these um, nice clinical assessments, we were able to show that the lower your CSF vasopressin level, the greater your social symptom severity um, on the ADOS severity, uh, symptom severity index. Um, what I will point out here as a little bit of a teaser is that the vasopressin was most closely related to social symptom severity and not the restricted repetitive behaviors. And because autism is so clinically heterogeneous, I think this points toward the need to do multiplex protein profiling to think of a biological signature, not only for autism in general, but potentially for subtypes. And I also want to point out that at least in older children, we've done some work in blood. We saw no group differences when we measure blood uh, vasopressin in blood. So neurotypical children and children with autism do not differ when we look at vasopressin in blood. So the next study we did was the kids that we had been studying so far had been behaviorally symptomatic and already diagnosed. And I knew that John Constantino at WashU had a um, kind of a rare one of a kind biospecimen archive of neonatal infants who had come in to get um, spinal taps for mild viral infections. And so um, I asked John, could we, could we do a medical record review? And so what we were able to do in a quasi perspective way was to go into medical records and identify children who is neonatal infants before the time when autism first manifests. So these were kids that were zero to three months of age, could we ask, you know, and then we followed these kids in their medical records up to 12 years of age, and we could identify a subset who had autism and a subset who went on to develop typically. And really excitingly, what we saw was that vasopressin levels in children who were behaviorally asymptomatic already showed this biomarker um, signal. We did not see it in CSF oxytocin. So what I want to do is make the point here that there's been an extraordinary amount of interest in oxytocin, something I'm also happy to talk about in the Q&A, but in every single study we've done, both in rhesus monkeys and in all of our patient-based studies, oxytocin levels never differ in CSF, but they always differ um, in with vasopressin. And so what we know here, at least in looking at these two related peptides, is that this isn't a a general altered signature of brain neurochemistry because the oxytocin levels don't differ, right? And so um, this also gives us, gave us some thinking about um, 
maybe where we could go with a treatment trial. And then I just want to point out here in the five ASD cases that we had that um, had fewer medical comorbidities later um, in life, what we saw here was this very stark separation between the kids who developed typically and the kids who went on to be diagnosed with autism. Okay, so this, of course, raised the very exciting possibility that vasopressin could be a possible therapeutic for autism. And what we know from um, a study that was done by um, Jan Born's group in Europe was that you could um, sniff neuropeptides, and what we can see is an increase in spinal fluid levels of vasopressin. And we don't exactly know how intranasal vasopressin um, targets the brain. There are several hypotheses that it might travel along the trigeminal pathway, the olfactory um, nerve pathway, or it may enter um, the brain indirectly through the blood capillary stream. But what we did know when we started our work was that single doses of vasopressin in healthy humans, so this is intranasally delivered, enhanced memory for social information, identification of social words, and cooperative behavior. But no prior research before our study had tested the safety or efficacy of intranasal vasopressin to improve social abilities in children with autism. Um, and so I teamed up with my um, colleague, Antonio Hardin at Stanford, who runs um, the many of the clinical trials for children with autism. And so we came up with several specific aims for this initial um, phase 2A um, clinical trial that was randomized double-blind placebo control. Um, so our first aim was to make sure that this was safe and well tolerated. Um, we assessed this by study dropout rate, vital sign monitoring, clinical chemistry labs in blood, um, uh, um, EKG, and um, the DOTS, which is a, um, a side effect scale that some clinician filled out. Um, our second goal was to test whether four weeks of BID, meaning twice a day intranasal vasopressin treatment, improved social abilities in children with autism. And so we used the social responsiveness scale as our primary endpoint. Um, but this is a, a scale that parent feels, uh, parents fill out. And so we wanted to also have convergent validation of our finding, which included um, clinician report on the CGI and also patient performance themselves on laboratory-based uh, laboratory social cognition tests. So what we found was that vasopressin treated patients, there were none that dropped out during the study. And there were no differences in adverse events between these two groups of vasopressin-treated and placebo-treated children. Um, we also had the children who were on placebo went into open label extension at the end of the trial. So we have good safety data um, from 30 children um, at the present time. Um, all of this is published, by the way, um, in Science Translational Medicine. Um, so I'm going to not belabor the point on the safety data, but it looked good. Um, and again, there was no significant changes in any of the other safety parameters that we cared about, including vital signs, clinical chemistry labs, or um, electrocardiogram during the vasopressin treatment. Um, and then excitingly, what we found was convergent evidence for vasopressin treatment efficacy. What we saw was a reduction in, uh, or an improvement here rather, um, in SRS total score um, in people that were treated um, with um, vasopressin, but not placebo. We saw an increase in the CGI. And we also saw that children were better at reading the mind and the eyes after four weeks of vasopressin treatment, and they were better at recognizing affect in, um, in pictures of people's faces. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish my talk by talking about the roadmap that we've constructed and where we are currently headed. So we developed a valid model, identified a biomarker or a target, we confirm the translation of the biology to patients, and we are currently working on um, multiplex protein profiles in spinal fluid that I would ultimately like to try to back out into blood, although it's not clear to me that will be possible. Um, we've launched this first successful um, vasopressin treatment trial. We are currently conducting a phase 2B larger vasopressin treatment trial as a single site with the hope that this can move into um, a phase 3 trial um, you know, fairly quickly thereafter. Um, we discovered this biomarker before symptoms emerge in neonatal human um, infants. Um, and then one thing that we would like to do is to confirm 
this in a epidemiological multi-site neonatal CSF and blood collection consortium where we have some very nice data. So even though CSF and blood levels of vasopressin don't seem to be correlated later in life, we have some very nice pilot data suggesting a very high correlation between CSF um, and blood levels of vasopressin in the neonatal period, suggesting, um, and that's very likely due to development of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so the idea would be that we might be able to identify this CSF-based signature and then see if we can see this in blood, which would allow um, more routine clinical monitoring. Um, and then we've done, I didn't talk about this, this work is unpublished, we have some beautiful data in rhesus monkeys showing that we can alter many core features of autism by administering vasopressin, including aspects of face recognition, joint attention, um, species specific responses to um, social cues, including pro-social initiation. And what I'd like to do next is we've got these neonatal rhesus monkeys that we know are at high risk for poor um, developmental outcomes. And what I'd like to do is treat them with vasopressin to see if we can alter their developmental outcomes so they don't um, develop this low social phenotype. So I just want to um, conclude by thanking the many collaborators who've made the work possible, the various mentees who've trained with me, the techs and RAs and many undergrads, and particularly um, the patients and families who have um, heroically participated in a lot of this work, um, all of the funding that we've received for it, um, and for the wonderful invitation to speak to you guys today, and then also you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. I don't know how we are on timing. Yeah, I think we're, um, we got a half out. Well, we're supposed to come back at 12.30 for lunch. So I don't think maybe you can answer the questions to the Q&A if possible. So we can get a little lunch and get back on track at 12.30 if that's okay. Yeah. But thanks for that really wonderful and very well put together uh, presentation. Very impressive and comprehensive. Thank, Thank you, you so much, uh, Dr. Fry, for um, spending all the